Awesome. Hey, we are closing out a series that we've been going through today called Afterlife, where we've been tackling this question of what happens after this life, right? What comes next? What happens after we die? Kind of like a somber question a little bit, right? But a very, very important question that we all kind of need to wrestle with at some point in our lives. Uh, And throughout the majority of this series so far, we've been talking about heaven and what heaven is going to be like, how to get to heaven. What does it mean that heaven is both present and future, right? We've been talking through that stuff. Uh, But today we're going to switch gears a little bit as we close out. And we're going to be talking about the part that honestly is a little bit less fun to talk about. And that is H-E double hockey sticks, right? Today we're going to be talking about hell. Uh, I don't know why they gave me this topic, but we're going to be (laughs) tackling it together and it's going to be a good time. Um, So As we kind of dive into today's message, you know, Pastor Tom came out a few weeks ago talking to us about what what heaven's going to be like, and he shared his experience going through heaven. Uh, So I figured I'd come out and share with with you guys my experience going through hell. Um, So a few years back, back in 2016, um, I got married. By the way, that is not the hell, just so we're, just so we're, uh, okay. Jess, if you're watching this, that's not hell. I love you. All right. Um. We got married and we were, I was 20, she was 21, um, and we were broke, right? We had like a, like pennies to our name, uh, but we figured, hey, we could either be broke or da- broken dating or broken married, and we were like, let's see how this goes, right? God's, God's got us, right? We're, we're living on love, living on a prayer. Um, so we, we made it work, and God bless my uncle. He kind of opened the door for us to be able to have our first place. Uh, he let us live in his back house for like the first year and a half of our marriage. And uh, to this day, I'm still extremely grateful that he did that for us. Uh, But I want you guys to kind of understand something here. It was not Eastvale. Uh, I know in Eastvale, we're comfortable with these like giant homes, right? Where 16 families can live inside of them and there's like still space left over. Uh, It wasn't like that home that has like the five bedroom house with like the two bedroom apartment attached to it, right? Like those next gen homes. No, it was... uh, it was a back house that actually, before we moved into it, uh, it used to be back in the day, a horse tack room. So like, I don't know if you guys, I didn't know what a horse tack room was. Like, I'm not a big horse guy. Like all the Norco people, you guys probably do. But like the horse tack room, that was, that was where they would keep the saddles and all the horse equipment. And then they decided to turn that into a back house. So uh, just to kind of, you know, run through, run through the expectations of this place with you guys. We did not have indoor plumbing, which meant, No bathroom back there. Uh, My poor wife had to walk to the main house every time, right? Uh, We had no bathroom. We had no sink to do our dishes. We had no, like, gas lines or anything like that. So no oven, no stove. And we were just, like, bare bones, you know. But we we did things to make it work. We got, like, an electric cooktop and stuff like that. And and it was good until the rain came. (laughs) And then, to be honest, I, I still have a little bit of PTSD here because... I just, every time it rains now, I think our house is going to leak. Like where, (laughs) I'm looking for the bubbles, right? Because, man, we had leaks all over the place. I remember one day I woke up, it was raining. Apparently 2016 was just like the rainiest year we ever had. Because, man, it would rain constantly, and there was just like a trickle upon our bed. And we were just like, what are we doing? I remember one day uh, I came home, and our ceiling actually caved in. Check this out. This is, the bubble was like two feet low, and then it just finally gave out one day. So we had to like tear it all out. Uh, But that wasn't even the worst part. Uh, I remember there were nights where I would be working at youth, and uh, I'd be, you know, hanging out late on a Wednesday night, and my wife would call me, and she'd be like, hey, like, I really need you to come home, like, right after youth tonight. And I'd be like, okay, like, what's going on? She'd tell me, I hear scratching. 
I'm like, whoa. <laughs> like, what do you mean you hear scratching? She's like, it's in the walls. I was like, what do you mean there's scratching in the walls? And, and I was like, okay, we either have like a mouse that's messing with you or like there's a demon in the house and you got to get out like right now, right? Like something was going on. But believe it or not, that wasn't even the worst part. The worst part was this. Uh, there was a day where I woke up and uh, my dog was fighting with a bee. And I was like, that's, that's weird. Like, how did a bee get in the house? Like, our windows are closed and everything. How did a bee get in the house? And then we get the bee out, and then I turn around, and there's like four more bees in our house. And I'm like, where are these bees coming from? I look over to the corner of our house, and there's a little hole on the wall. And I start to see bees come in through the hole. And then I realize that there's a hole on the outside of our home where apparently bees have been getting into and colonizing and essentially building up an army to attack us. <laughs> so we find out that we have thousands and thousands of bees living inside of our walls. And so I did what any good husband would do, grabbed a roll of duct tape and just sealed that bad boy up. <laughs> Never had, pretended like it wasn't there, right? I mean, we could have had like a swarm of bees any day, but man, it was exciting living on the edge. Uh, now, was that actually hell? I mean, I don't know. You can ask my wife. She'll probably give you a better idea. But here's the thing that, that we all have some idea of what hell would be like, right? We all have some picture of it, some vision of it. Some people, they think that hell is to be tormented by cats day and night, right? Some people think it's watching cats day and night, right? Other people, they, they get this idea that uh, hell is, you know, no big deal because after all, all my friends are going to hell. So like, we're just going to hang out down there, you know, party it up. Uh, some people, they, they think that hell is the place that is ruled by Satan and his demons. And so everyone who goes there is going to be just tortured forever and ever by them. Uh, some people, if, how many of you have seen The Good Place, the, the show from like NBC? Yeah, if you've seen that, then like you might think of it as like the bad place, right? This place where like demons just kind of mess with humans for fun. Or to be honest, some people even have this belief that hell doesn't even exist, right? That hell's not actually this real place. Some people think that hell is actually just a creation by religion, right? A man-made creation to uh, use kind of fear tactics to control people, right? Kind of like conspiracy theory, theory stuff. But, but whatever you think about hell, uh, it's kind of important, Right? I love what A.W. Tozer said. A.W. Tozer once wrote this in his book, Knowledge of the Holy One, that what you say about God is the most important thing about you. What you say, what you think, what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. And, and I agree with that. And I would add to that, that what you believe about eternity is also extremely important. Why is that? Because what you believe about eternity, this is what I want us to understand today. What you believe about eternity determines how you live today. It, it affects every decision you make, the way that you speak with others, the way that you treat others, the way you deal with your finances, the way you deal with everything in this life. If you have an eternity, if you, if you have an eternity in heaven focused mindset, then that'll be different as to if you just think this life is all we get, Right? So what you believe about eternity determines how you live today. And so I did a little bit of research to figure out what do people actually believe about eternity, right? What do people think about eternity? This is uh, what the Pew Research Center was able to find out by doing some surveys that about 74% of Americans, again, this is not Christians, this is just Americans, uh, about 74% of Americans believe in heaven. So whether it's the Christian heaven, whether, you know, it's some sort of paradise or something, whether it's, you know, what they saw an all dogs go to heaven, whatever it might be, they believe in some sort of heaven. Meanwhile, only four in 10, so 40% of people believe that those who reject Christ will spend eternity in hell, which I find interesting because of the people surveyed, it was a large group of Christians. And to be honest, we might not like to hear it or to say it, but that is what the Bible teaches, that without Christ, we receive hell right? Only four in 10 people believe that. And then this one is interesting too, that half of 1% of people, so 0.5% of people believe that they are personally going to hell. 
So if we took a poll, right, there, there, there might be about like 200 people in here today. One of you thinks you're going to hell. <laughs> but we often don't think about it ourselves, right? We, we think, okay, hell is, hell is a place for the really bad people, right? Hell is a place for the murderers. It's a place for the Adolf Hitlers, for the, for the Joseph Stalins of the world. It's not a place for me, right? I mean, I'm a pretty good person. I might like get, I might cuss someone out on the road, but I mean, come on, that's, that's about it, right? Is hell really the place for me? But I, th- I think Jesus speaks to uh, what hell is in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. This is what he says. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But listen to this. Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Only half of a percent of people believe that they're going to hell. But Jesus tells us it's potentially flipped. Because the the narrow road is the one that leads to life. The wide road, the road that more people are on, is the one that leads to destruction. And so we need to understand, right, what is the difference between the two roads? What leads us down one road or the other? You see, what you believe about eternity matters a whole lot. And here's the thing that Uh, I believe that one of the greatest tricks of the devil, one of the greatest attacks of the devil is to try to convince you that there is no hell. If you've been told by someone that, or or if you've believed that there is no hell, I believe that that is a trick of the devil. And And it's because of this too, right? That the devil will ask questions like, would a good God really allow a place like hell? And you may, you may have asked yourself that question. You may have heard that question be asked. And, and it's almost kind of a valid question, right? Would a good God really allow a place like hell? But the, the devil responds and says, no, of course not, right? He, he's good. Why, why would he allow people to be punished for their sins? I mean, come on, it's just a little sin, right? Like, it's no big deal. And so we wind up convincing ourselves. We wind up becoming convinced that hell isn't a big deal that there is no place like hell. But you know what the danger in that is? That when there is no hell, when there is no punishment, when there is no consequence for our sins, people live however they want, right? There, there's, no, there's no consequences, so, so we can justify all of our sins. It doesn't matter if you reject Christ or accept Christ at that point. We have no more fear of God. And let's be honest, if there is no hell, then you know what you should do? You should live up this life as much as possible. Because after all, we're all going to the same place, right? So it it doesn't even matter. So, So live this life for worldly pleasures, live it for comfort, for money, for sex, every worldly pleasure that you can possibly attain. That's how we should live if there is no hell. But that's not what Jesus says. That's not what scripture leads us to believe. In fact, Jesus in the New Testament, he actually brings up hell and references hell over 70 times, which tells us it's not just some kind of back burner topic, but it's something that Jesus wants us to understand and realize that this is a very real thing that should affect our lives. We need to come to terms with the fact that hell does exist. But when we do come to terms with the fact that hell does exist, it begs the question, why? Right? Because the question I asked earlier, why would a good God allow a place like hell is a valid question. So we need to come to terms with why does hell exist, right? That's the question we're going to tackle today. Why does hell exist? First answer to that, we're going to tackle two answers to it today. Hell exists for God to deal righteously with Satan. Hell exists for God to deal righteously with Satan. Uh, because of media and you know cartoons and everything out there, um, there's kind of been this idea about Satan that he's really not that harmful, right? That he's just kind of this guy in a, in a red suit with a pitchfork and horns, right? There's even like a show out there, Lucifer, where, where, you know, he's really not that bad of a guy and stuff like that. Like that's what some people believe about Satan. But here's, what, here's the truth, that Satan is not that. He is the full embodiment of all evil. He, he is 
the full rejection of every good thing that God has, everything that God is for, Satan stands against. Here's how the Bible describes him. It describes him as the destroyer, the deceiver, the dragon, the dark angel, the serpent. He is the adversary, the enemy, the tempter, the wicked one, the thief. He is a father of lies, the prince of darkness, the angel of the abyss. He is behind every addiction, every abuse, every fear, every pain, every shame. He is here to steal your joy, to kill your faith, to destroy your health, ruin your finances, obliterate your marriage, and take your kids. But with all of that, with all that he is, I want you to hear me on this, that most importantly, he is defeated. Satan is defeated and he knows it. God has already claimed victory and God has already determined where Satan is going to wind up and that is hell. And so Satan knows this and you know what his game plan is now? He's not playing to win. He's playing to destroy, right? He knows that God loves his creation. He loves us. And so Satan's game plan is to steal away as many of God's children as possible. To, to destroy that relationship that we could have with our heavenly father, with the one who created us. And so that is what he attempts to do. But listen to this. Listen to what uh, Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 tells us as to what will happen to Satan. It says this, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of, bur of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hell is the place that Satan is going. Matthew 25, verse 41 says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire. Listen to this. Prepared for the devil and his angels. I want you guys to understand this today, that hell was not a place that was prepared for you. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. I love the fact that Jesus, when he's speaking with his disciples, he says that I go to prepare a place for you, speaking of heaven. Heaven is a place that's prepared for humanity. Hell is a place that we go to when we reject God. Why is that? Because the second reason that hell exists is this, that hell exists for God to deal righteously with sin. Hell exists for God to deal with Satan, but hell exists for God to also deal with sin. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us very plain and simple that for the wages of sin is death. And here's the truth. You don't even have to raise your hand for this. I know that we're all sinners, right? We, we've all fallen short. Romans 3.23 says, For all have fallen short of the glory of God. There is a bar that is set, and it is too high for us to attain. We, we, are, we are liars. We are cheats. We are adulterers. We are, we are wicked in our hearts. And because of that, our, our natural progression, the natural result of, of the condition of our heart is hell, is hell death. That's what Romans 6 23 tells us. But, but we think, right, like that's not fair though, God, because like I'm, I'm not a bad person, right? God, how are you going to send good people to hell? And what we need to understand is this, that, that God's not sending good people to, to heaven and bad people to hell. God is sending saved people to heaven and unsaved people to hell. Because all people, all of us, every single one of us, we deserve hell. That's the truth. It's not a matter of if you can be good enough because you know what? You've already taken that test and I hate to say it, but you failed. I've failed, right? That's a test that we will not pass at all unless we have someone take it for us. And that's why we need Jesus, right? Right? That's why we need Jesus, because he is the one who takes our place. He is the one who takes the punishment that we deserve. We deserve hell, but because of Jesus, we receive grace. Amen? You see, the thing about God is that it is impossible for God to be holy without him being just. God needs to be just. 
It's, it's in his character. It, it's, it's a part of who he is, that God is, yes, a good God. He is a holy God, but he is a just God. And if he allows sin to go unpunished, then he's not a good judge. He's not a just judge. For, for a criminal to walk into a courtroom and to be 100% fully guilty And for the judge to let him walk out of that room with no consequences, no one to pay the price for for the crimes that have been committed, that would be an awful judge. And we would all be upset, right? Because that's unjust. That's injustice at, at its very finest. And if that's what happened with God, then God would be unjust. But that's not how God works. God is a good judge, and therefore there needs to be a price for the crime. There needs to be some sort of punishment for the sin. And so hell exists as a place for God to deal righteously with sin. And I get it, like, guys, this is no fun of a topic, right? This this is like, man, they got to take heaven over the past like four weeks, (laughs) and I'm stuck like having having to go through this. But, But here's why we need to talk about it, right? Because if we don't accept this reality, then we miss out on the goodness of the gospel. If we don't realize what we've been saved from, then we can't rejoice in the way that God desires for us to rejoice. We have to understand the reality and the horror of hell so that we can rightfully give God thanks and praise when we realize what he's done to save us from it. I love what C.S. Lewis says, He once said this when uh, talking about hell. He said that there is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom and it has the support of reason. See, it's not something that sits easily with us. This idea that our, our friends, perhaps some of our family members, that hell is the place that they're going to, that is something that should kind of hurt us a little bit, right? Shouldn't sit easy with us. But just because it doesn't sit easy with us doesn't make it not true. We need to deal with the reality of it so that we can see what we ought to do about it. But here's the thing that I love, that Jesus, he actually... He, he doesn't just tell us, hey, there's this place called hell. You really got to watch out for it, right? He gives us some glimpses as to what is this place? What can we understand about it? And specifically, one of, the, one of the best passages that kind of tackles this topic is Luke chapter 16, where Jesus talks through this story of the rich man and Lazarus. And, and I call it a story because there's a little bit of debate between biblical scholars as to if this is a parable, me, meaning, you know, a story that, didn't actually happen, more, more of an illustration, or is this a true story that Jesus is telling? And people go back and forth because in the story, Jesus doesn't outright call it a parable, and this is the only story that Jesus tells that actually uses a personal name. We get the name of the beggar in this story, and his name is Lazarus. And so whether you believe it's a true story or a parable, here's what I want us to understand that that what Jesus is alluding to here, the, the, the type of afterlife that he is describing is still very real. Jesus didn't dabble in science fiction, right? He, 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 in all of his stories, in all of his parables, he still brings up reality. He talks about the parable of the sower, right? Something that was very, very real to the community he was speaking to. He talks about the, the parable of the, of the lost sheep, right? The speaking to, to a community that was familiar with shepherds, right? He talks about real things. And so in this, I want us to understand that he's not speaking about science fiction. He's speaking about reality here. And so Luke chapter 16, here's how the story goes. It begins in verse 19, that there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Now, really quick, the fact that he was dressed in purple and, he, and fine linen, that meant that he was loaded, right? Like he wasn't just rich, like he was richer than rich. Like I'm pretty sure his name was Richie Rich, right? He had a lot of money 
is what I'm trying to say. Because back then, uh, even the color purple, right? Like it, you, you needed to buy this rare type of dye that was very expensive. So whoever was, re- whoever was wearing purple was showing, I'm like royalty. I've got money, right? So that's what this man is kind of in, right? The position that he's in. In verse 20, it tells us, at his gate, was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. You see, the, the way this worked was uh, back then, because there was no silverware, right? Uh, after a meal, um, everything was kind of like finger foods, right? So, so Richie Rich was eating dino nuggets like all day. Um, and after he would be done with his d- dino nuggets, he would take some bread and he would scrape off the crumbs from his hands, right? And so outside of his gate lay this beggar named Lazarus. And Lazarus, he was close enough to be able to see the the food on his plate and be able to see him scrape the crumbs off of his hands. And he wanted it, but he was too far to get it. The story continues in verse 22. It says, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23 says, in Hades, where he was in torment. Really quick, I want to pause there uh, and and address this term, Hades, right? Hades. Uh, Hades is not hell. Hades and hell are kind of two different places. Hades is actually the Greek word for what they called in Hebrew, this place called Sheol or Sheol or however they pronounce it in Hebrew, right? (laughs) I'm going to say Shoal. Uh, so this place, it was basically where people would go after they die, right? It, it, was, it was the location of the afterlife. But here's the thing that we know from the New Testament and from what Paul writes is that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But for those who don't have Christ, it's... To be absent from the body is the beginning of suffering. It's the beginning of Hades. And that's where we see the rich man right now. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. I don't want us to miss this, that that he's in pain here, that, that, that he, is, he is calling out for anyone who is able, anyone who is, who, who is within earshot, anyone who can listen to come and help him if at all possible. Even the slightest bit of help, even just a drop of water, anything to relieve his suffering just for a moment. That's Hades. And, and that's kind of the hell before Hell, And that's what we need to understand. This is where people are going. This is the real place that Jesus speaks about, right? We get a glimpse of it, and it's described as this place of unspeakable torment. This, this fiery furnace, this place of burning sulfur or weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is not a comfortable place. This isn't a place that we should be comfortable with anyone going to. This is a problem. And like I said before, some people, you know, they have this idea, okay, well, well, yeah, I I might be in pain, but hey, at least there will be company there, right? At at least I'll see all my friends. (laughs) At least I'll I'll know people there. But that's not the case. That Hades and, and hell, that these places are places of isolation. They're called places of outer darkness where there is no light, no people, no hope. There's nothing. An angel once described um, what would happen to those separated from Christ in Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11. It says this, They too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. That they will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Listen to this. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. Not only is it a painful place, but it's an eternal place. We need to understand that, that there is no end. There is no relief. There is no comfort. It's eternal. So the rich man is in Hades, but what about hell, right? 
The Greek word that we find throughout the New Testament that refers to hell is this word Gehenna. It's not Hades, but it's this word Gehenna. And Gehenna, it comes from the Valley of Hinnom. And it means uh, this place of everlasting punishment. It referred to this very real place that the people Jesus was speaking to would know about, right? And Jesus, he uses this word Gehenna several times to refer to this garbage dump, this, this place south of Jerusalem where people would go to burn things, where, where waste and sewage and flesh were burned there. And, and it was just this, this fire that continually burned, this fire that continually burned and there were dead animals in the fire and there were bodies of criminals in the fire and there was human waste in the fire and there was, there was even this, this false god that people worshipped named Molech where they would sacrifice their firstborn sons in the fires of Gehenna to this god. You see, it was this place that, that even, even reeked, it, it smelled, right? People would stay inside whenever the winds would kick the stench up to them because it was just this awful, awful place. And Jesus uses this, this real life picture to describe hell, to describe what it will be like. It will be an eternal fire of torturous suffering and unending pain. To be thrown into the lake of fire, to be thrown into hell, to be thrown into Gehenna is to be thrown into eternal fire. One commentary reads that hell is the land of no more, that there is no beauty, no laughter, no more peace, no more friendship, no more joy, no more hope, and most importantly, no more chances. That it is the end. That every good thing that we experience from God in this world and the next is gone. It does not exist in hell. And the story goes on. Jesus tells the story, Luke chapter 16, verses 27 and 28. He answered, the rich man answered, Then I beg you, speaking to Father Abraham, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. See, when he realized that his fate was sealed, his mind went to his brothers. And there's really four lessons that I want us to pull out of this story here. The first one is this, that the rich man was fully conscious and aware. Sometimes we think like, oh, are we going to remember anything after this life, right? In the next life, will we remember anything? It appears so. That the rich man, he, he remembered who Lazarus was. He remembered who Abraham was. He remembered that he had brothers. He had a memory. He was conscious enough to be able to feel and experience the pain that was happening to him. He was aware that, that he was in there for a reason. He was conscious and he was aware. And he, he felt that regret, right? That, man, if I could do something different, I wish I had. Second thing we learn from this lesson or from this story is that the rich man's eternal that the rich man's eternal destiny was irrevocably fixed. In verses 25 and 26, after the rich man calls out to Abraham, Abraham explains to the rich man that that, they, that he can't help him because that there is a chasm between them. There is a separation between them. There is a a distance between them that they cannot cross from there to him, and he cannot cross from there to them. What's done is done. His fate is sealed and that is where he will be for eternity. That is the kind of life that he will experience in the afterlife. The third lesson I want us to understand today is that the rich man knew that his suffering was just. This is so important, guys, that we understand that the rich man never complained saying, God, this isn't fair. I don't understand. I was a good person. I gave money to people, right? I don't understand why I'm here. God, this is unjust. He never said that. He complained about the pain that he was experiencing, but he knew that he was there because of how he had lived his life. He knew exactly why he was there. And the thing is that because he knew why he was there, 
he thought back to his brothers and knew that if they don't change, if they don't receive Christ, if nothing happens for them, they are coming to the same exact place. And so the fourth lesson that we need to receive from today is that the rich man begged and pleaded for someone to help his brothers know Jesus. Because he understood this, that hell is real. Hell is painful. Hell is eternally, or hell is eternal. But I want us to understand this as well, that most importantly, hell is avoidable. It is not a place that we are sentenced to with, without any sort of escape. God gives us another option. Jesus says that's the wide road. It leads to destruction, but there's another road to go down and it is the narrow road. And you know where that leads? It leads to life. Hell is avoidable because God is a just God. He needs to punish sin. But here's the good news today that God is not just just. He is gracious. He is merciful. And he, he delivers that to us through his son, through Jesus. I want, I want to read off some scripture to you guys, starting with Romans 6, 23. I started this one for you because I want you to understand this, that the wages of sin is death. But listen to this, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what we receive. And it's not based on what we do, it's all based on what Christ has done. Romans chapter five, verses eight and nine says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, while we were still lost. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the good news of the gospel, that we are all deserving of hell, but God gives us an out. That God loves you so much that he says, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna take the price for your sin. I'm gonna take the punishment upon myself so that I don't, I don't see you as a sinner anymore but instead I see you as a son. I see you as a daughter. I see you as co-heirs with Christ. And that, that is what we are when we receive the love and grace and mercy of Jesus. But I want us to understand this as well, that, that the knowledge of hell is not just something for us to receive and receive God's grace and then move on, right? The job's not done. We need to be outwardly focused. We need to, to look around and see that there are people in our lives, people who we love, people who we, who we don't wish any harm to come to, who are going here if they don't have Jesus. That's the reality. There's this story of a, of a man named Charles Peace. He was, a, he was a murderer and a burglar in Britain in the 1800s. And at one point he's caught and he's sentenced to execution. On, and on his execution day, he's standing there awaiting to be executed. And a priest comes up and he's reading to him about hell, letting him know, hey, this is what you're gonna experience in a few moments if you don't receive Jesus. And, and Charles Peace, he, he's listening to the priest and, and, and he's kind of shocked at how the priest is just able to, to talk about hell so nonchalantly as he looks a man in the eyes who in a few short moments could be going there. And Charles Peace, he looks at the priest and here's what he says. He says, sir, if I believed what you say that you believe, if I believed in the hell that you are talking about, then even if England were covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk over it if need be on hands and knees and think it worthwhile living just to save one soul from eternal hell like that. Man, how powerful is an, is an accurate understanding of what hell is. That's how we should live our lives. 
that, that if we truly believe what we claim to believe, if we truly believe what we're talking about today, that, that hell is a place, that, uh, this awful place that is eternal, painful, and that we're all deserving of that, but there's a way out, then why wouldn't we share that? We, we, we think, oh, I don't want to bother people with my faith. Oh, I don't want to bother people with my religion. Oh, it's not the right time. Then when is the right time? We, we should be spurred on not just to love each other through good deeds, but through the word as well, through the gospel, through the sharing of the good news that Jesus came, not just for you, not just for me, but for all of humanity so that we could be entered into a relationship with God. Because I want you to understand this as well, that Jesus didn't just come to save you from hell in the afterlife. He came to save you from hell in this life. In the same way that we experience heaven, not just in the future, but in the present, we all know this, that we can experience hell, not just in the future, but in the present. That, that little glimpses of it come through as we experience the consequences of our sin, as we experience bo broken relationships, as we experience addiction and pain that comes through this life, Jesus says, I want to set you free from that. If you're not comfortable with that, if you're not comfortable with the way that your life is going, if you're worried about, hey, this is what you're stepping into in eternity, I want to set you free from that, not just then, but I want to set you free from it now as well. Because I already took the price. I already went to the cross. The deed is done. All you need to do is receive it. All you need to do is receive it. Romans is so clear that if you confess with your tongue and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you will be saved. And when we do that, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes into our lives and changes everything. Changes what we rejoice in. Changes what we delight in changes what we hate, he changes everything. And so we, would we hear this message? Would we hear the, the fact that there is a hell? It is a real place and we are all deserving of it. But would we grab a hold of the grace that is available to us through Jesus? Would you pray with me as we close out today? God, we thank you for the warning. We thank you for the understanding that, that hell is real, that, that this is a place that we do not want to end up in to be cut off from you entirely, to be cut off from every good thing, to experience the full weight of the punishment of the sins that we've committed, Lord. God, it should give us some sort of regret. It should make us want to turn things around. It should make us want to live differently but not simply out of fear, but because of the knowledge that you've set us free, because of the knowledge that there's something better for us, that there's something available to us, that there is a, a love that is greater than life, that there is a life after this life, that, that, that if we rejoice in you, God, that is better than anything we could ever imagine, anything we could ever fathom. And so if you're, if you're here today and you're listening to this message and, and you haven't allowed the weight of what hell really is and the fact that we are all deserving of it, sit in your heart. And maybe for the first time, maybe for multiple times, you hear that and you, you realize that something needs to change and you want to receive the grace that is available to you through Christ if you want to be assured of your salvation, knowing I am going to heaven when I die, not because of anything I've done, but because of everything that Jesus has done. If you want to receive that grace today, would you raise your hand right now so that I can pray with you? Would you just throw that hand up? We'll pray together. God, we just lift up these brothers and sisters who you're working in their hearts right now, Lord. Would you comfort them? Would you remind them that although we are sinners, that you came for the sinners. You came for the lost, the hurting, the let down. 
and you came to set us free. God, we praise you for the glory of heaven. And we thank you for saving us from the horrors of hell. Lord, we love you so much. We pray all this in your name. And everybody said, amen.